Good morning from a sunny new forest where the wind, I'm very pleased to say, has disappeared. There's just a ripple of movement in the beautiful green beech leaves around us. And I've come in camouflage this morning. <laughs> this is the closest I can get to early May Beach. You might um, not be able to see Chris, but you can hear to, him. <laughs> hoping to blend into the background uh, this morning. Um, those were Kate McRae's blue tits in the box. It's day nine. If you've been watching those birds, you can see how rapidly they're developing there. Their body feathers are coming through. They've changed colour. There's more blue than pink in the bottom of that nest. Parents are in attendance, of course, as you mm, said, Meg. Very busy. thousand caterpillars a day for you know, coming into those nests. I was reading a couple of years ago in Bird Study, the excellent journal of the British Trust for Ornithology. Do join if you're not members. Mm. They've got this brilliant thing on garden birds, which they do. It's just truly fantastic. Um, that uh, Some work was being done in, I think it was Czechoslovakia, and they were looking at blue tits in urban areas. And one very large, mature oak tree could offer enough food to satisfy one brood of blue tits. So that gives you an idea of the abundance of caterpillars that can occur on these trees at this time of year. Because if that many are being harvested by blue tits to feed their young, there have to be a considerable um, excess to make sure that everything else that eats them gets something to eat. Plus enough of the caterpillars survive to pupate and get the next generation of moths going, those geometrid moths which they're so fond of feeding their young this, in, this time of year. So yeah, really good stuff, really good stuff. And you can find that of course on uh, Kate McRae's website which is Kate, Mc Kate sorry, Wildlife Kate at alfrescowild.co.uk Wildlife Kate at alfrescowild.co.uk and on Twitter she's Wildlife Kate. Excellent lady whole garden is plumbed with cameras showing you all sorts of interesting things throughout the course of the year so try and tune into wildlife Day mm -hmm. and follow those three tips how are you Beast? all right yeah i'm feeling okay so i've got a bit of a tickle in my throat i'm trying not to cough <coughs> but otherwise i'm all good i'm all good how are you uh, i'm a bit I, yeah no i didn't have a great night I, I i ended the evening after punk rock midnight by trying to watch series three of twin peaks and i don't oh. know if anyone else out there has tried i mean frankly i'm four programs in and yeah, it's getting a bit taxing, to be quite honest with you. I mean, I can go to those sorts of surreal, um, laconic, um, meaningless environments at about one in the morning. <laughs> I've been doing it most of my life. But I mean, honestly, it's challenging, it's challenging. Yeah. And then, and then um, I had a, a sweaty moment in bed. I don't know what that was about, I can't recall. Um, and then this morning, for the first time in a year, Nancy weed on the bed. Full volume, the whole bladder, oh. the whole bladder works on the, on the duvet. She's never done that, has she? At so seven o'clock this morning. It's a nice treat. So at this moment, everything's getting washed, and, um, <laughs> except for my hand. Okay, oh. I'm going to sit over there a little bit. <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> Please, yeah, let's, let's, move on. let's move on. Now, a theme running throughout our broadcast, of course, has been mental health. We know that spending time in nature makes us feel calmer. It helps us mentally and physiologically as well. And yesterday we had a fantastic clip from Emma Mitchell. A little bit about how our brain works and how we feel happier when we spend time outdoors. Now, Emma has a fantastic book called The Wild Remedy. I've just been looking through it. And I mean, the illustrations in here are absolutely stunning. Um, as is the wording, of course. Now, I wanted to read you a little excerpt from the back. This was written by Joanna Cannon about the book. And it says, an absolute joy. Rarely do you find a book that soothes both the mind and soul, but the wild remedy has managed it. This is such a powerful and beautiful book. And I can't think of anyone whose life would not be in a better place for having read it. So a wild, the wild remedy, the wild remedy you can find. And it's a fantastic book to read. And I'm pleased to say, that Emma is going to be joining us again today. This time she's going to be telling us a little bit about a surprising remedy that mm. I had no idea mm. of either. No. So take a look at this from Emma. Yesterday I talked about three brain biochemicals, the levels and balance of which we can actually change by getting out into nature. And by that route, we can alter our mental health for the better. Cortisol is a stress hormone. Its levels are raised when we're really worried about something, such as during pandemic and lockdown. And when its levels are raised, we get anxiety symptoms and over long periods, even symptoms of depression. The other two biochemicals are neurotransmitters, that serotonin and dopamine, and they both make us feel positive and uplifted in different ways. But the tricky situation comes when cortisol is raised because actually that suppresses the levels of the other two. So we've got a double whammy and a situation that can lead to really low mood over long periods. 
what I'm going to talk about today is this brownish black stuff here, soil. So you might think, well, this isn't Gardener's World. What's she talking about? But actually, there is a benign bacterium in soil that has been shown to shift our mental health for the better. So it's called Mycobacterium vacai, and it's not um, a pathogen of humans. It doesn't make our insides poorly. We don't get a stomach upset. It's completely benign. And when we come in contact with it through gardening, a bit of weeding, just a bit of like germinating some seeds on your windowsill, uh, maybe even just sitting on the floor of a woodland if you're going for a walk, just sit there for a few minutes for a bit of a rest. You'll come in contact with this bacterium as it's extremely common. And when you do so, maybe you inhale a little kind of parts of its coating up your nose. Don't be alarmed, it's nothing bad will happen. In fact, what happens is parts, various pathways are triggered in our brains and a group of neurons releases serotonin, one of those feel-good neurotransmitters I mentioned. So it's going to lift your mood and that fits with experiments and anecdotal evidence that shows that gardening or being in contact with the soil can make you feel better. Other experiments with Mycobacterium vacai have shown that it diminishes anxiety and it can also even alleviate the symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. So this is potent stuff. And if it's got a link with anxiety and diminishing it, it's probably decreasing our cortisol too. So my advice is this, whether you have a garden or not, try and grow something. Grow some herbs on your windowsill, tend to your house plants. You'll come in contact with compost or soil and therefore with this bacterium. If you do have a garden or a balcony or a little space to grow, go outside, weed, grow some peas, anything. It can really help your mental health during lockdown. And now it's back to Chris and Megs in the New Forest. Thank you. That's absolutely remarkable. I was just casting my mind back to, I think it was Mary Poppins. I'm not very good on those sorts of musical type things. It's a, there's, a, there's a black hole in my knowledge there. <laughs> but was it Mary Poppins where it was a spoonful of sugar? Yeah, it makes the medicine go down. Well, it's not. It's a spoonful of soil. A spoonful of soil. A spoonful of soil. Who would have thought a soil bacteria capable of improving our mental health? And it's no wonder, therefore, is it that gardening is so popular? All these people have been self-medicating for years without ever realising that. Mm. The science behind the, a better understanding of how nature is offering us for mental health cure is absolutely Incredible. brilliant. Emma, thank you very much. Yeah. The Wild Remedy, and I didn't mention the book title yesterday, which was an oversight. And the reason for that was that I hadn't had a mouthful of soil. Quite clearly. <laughs> you hadn't had your mouthful of soil in the morning. <laughs> you can catch up with Emma and more of her tips and remarkable story mm. uh, by following her on Twitter at Silver Pebble and on Instagram at Silver Pebble 2. Silver Pebble 2 on Instagram, Silver Pebble on Twitter. Mm. Fantastic, and do check that book out. Well. Now, on to our quiz of the day. Now, if you remember yesterday, we are using unusual contraptions <laughs> that are meant to be mimicking the, bird, uh, the sound of birds. Um, so this, today's one comes in this lovely box here. Yeah, beautiful little box. <laughs> it's a very unusual one. It's mm. very, mm. a bit wacky, this one, isn't it? Mm. So here we are. This is the sound for today. Right, right, yeah, that's, that's quite vigorous. Sorry. I can't stop. It's really good fun. Right, okay. Now, if you weren't watching yesterday, you're, uh, you, you, you may not know that I purchased these um, these devices from a, a relatively eccentric, oh, don't turn the back of the box. Um, no, no, no. Right, so a, a relatively eccentric Frenchman who, in his hands, when he was using these things, they really did sound just like the birds. So, you know, it wasn't a, a, a purchase of stupidity on my part. I thought that if I bought them, I could accurately, you know, reproduce the sounds of those birds. But um, obviously it requires a little bit of uh, je ne sais quoi, je ne sais quoi, oui, oh, oh, oh. No. <laughs> which, which neither Megan or I have. But if you think you know what those pipes might have made, replicated the sound of, then do let us know, obviously, on oh. Facebook and uh, Twitter and YouTube. That would be great. Now, I'm very pleased now that we can go to our guest today, brilliant naturalist. He was uh, on our broadcast before. Um, he's down in Devon, South, isolating. He's got the best mug that I've seen so far in the hands of any of our guests. He is the one and only Nick Baker. Uh, Nick, 
Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Good morning. I'm okay. Up and down. You know, the the, the Corona coaster is, uh, has its effects. You know, have good days where, you know, my my soul is lifted by finding some tree pipits where there hasn't been tree pipits before. And then I have bad days where I suddenly think about the mortgage. It's like being 10 with a mortgage is probably the best way of describing my life right now. It's lovely and terrifying all at the same time. But yeah, you, you like the mug then? Look at that. It's great. Give it's it nice, something. isn't it? Look at that. It, it looks like that one of my freezer drawers full of dead birds <laughs> that I keep finding. They're so beautiful. Even when they're dead, they're beautiful. And um, obviously, you're allowed to sort of poke them and look at the details, which is something they object to when they're alive. So it's quite nice. Um, but yeah, this is Esther Tyson's work, who's a friend of us, of our, of, of us both, really. And she's... Um, I think currently one of my favourite artists, so I like her. So it wasn't meant as a deliberate plug, but it is my, it's my, it's the first time for a couple of years where I've actually had time to drink out of it. So it's, uh, it's quite nice. I'm, I'm savouring the little details, you know. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And what have you been doing, a bit, you know, in, 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 in your garden? What, what gems have you got for us today? Last time it was oil beetles, which were truly superb. Yeah, um, well, it's, I mean, there's still oil beetles knocking around. I've actually had them in, actually directly in the garden in the last week. Um, also got bloody nose beetles as well. There's, you know, uh, I mean, today's, uh, well, the last couple of days has been pretty bad. We've gone from having almost summer-like weather where all the insects have been have been going for it. I've had nocturnal bats flying over the garden in the evening up there with the swifts and the swallows. It's all going really well. And then last night when I, I planned to be singing the praises and, and, and exulting in the diversity of moth life, because moths are one of those few wildlife species that you can actually bring to you with the right kind of toys. Um, and I had a, you know, I had a great plans. You know, we've been having some really beautiful moths in the trap until, um, well, until last night, where out of the two and a half thousand possibilities that we could have in a moth trap, I have only got two. But they're good too. <laughs> They were good too. They're, They're not going to win. Um, well, there is something going on on Twitter. I don't know if you've seen it called the Moth World Cup. If you hashtag Moth World Cup, I think the idea is to sort of um, vote moths in and out. But they, they've made the mistake, I think, of going for the obvious gaudy ones, the cheap moths in many ways. Um, I have got, uh, well, I'll start off with the, the less impressive. I'm mean, just I have actually got the moth trap down here. Like, this is my egg boxes, which is what you put in the bottom of a moth trap to uh, to give the moth somewhere to go. I've got the it's not very, it's not very well actually. Um, I've got a, a muslin moth. Okay, so it's a little grey one. It's quite beautiful, but obviously its beauty isn't really going to translate uh, very well through a tiny, tiny little lens on my phone um, and via the internet uh, to your screens. But it's uh, this is a male. Only the males turn up in our moth traps. Well, the females do occasionally, but it's many of the males are out there looking for females. I better move my coffee in case he drops off my finger. Um, but he's a really beautiful little moth, um, and you can tell he's male. One, he's he's really dark. He's got this lovely sort of mm, soft grey, almost a velveteen grey. These lovely little uh, white legs with little orange um, highlights, and of course these beautiful pectinate antennae. But you, of course, you can't see any of that, so I'm just having to describe it to you. But um, they're cracking little moths. Um, why they're called muslin moths, I have absolutely no idea. I, I understand it's because the female, which is actually quite white um, and, and spotty, kind of um, looks a bit like muslin. But then so do lots of the other moths in this family. It's one of the ermine moths, so-called, named after the robes of uh, or the, the, the trimmings of, uh, of, um, of uh, royal, royal robes, which are often sort of white with black specks, um, named after the ermine, of course, which is the, uh, the winter uh, pelage of the uh, of the stoats but uh, anyway there he is that's that's that species number one i know it's not that impressive um well i think is impressive but i can't it's not nick, a very good internet nick, nick, one. Nick, yesterday nick, yesterday we had harpy eagles nick well that's, yeah and <laughs> your point <laughs> okay right right okay here's a moth here's a moth that's gonna yeah, fortunately <laughs> fortunately i got a big one as well so i've got little gray moths um, but I've got the moth, which I think is a real World Cup um, moth World Cup winner. That one there, fortunately, saved the day or the night. Um, that there is uh, one of our earlier hawk moths. That's a poplar hawk moth, and I think these things are beautiful. Just one look at the poplar hawk moth. This is again a male because again the males are often the ones that come to light. Um, 
This one's a male. He's got this lovely skinny little abdomen. But look at those wings. There's no other moth in the UK or hawk moth in the UK which, which does that. It brings its wings, its hind wings, which are normally hidden in other species underneath the forewings. It brings them up to the fore, which kind of makes them look less moth-like. And it looks just like a bundle of dead leaves. Now, for me, the subtlety of this insect um, makes it probably one of it's just beautiful camouflage it's one of the most beautiful moths and for me when I see these things it takes me straight back to pre-moth trap days you see the moth trappings in my life have arrived later on in life um, you know with, with disposable income I was able to invest in um, a professional moth trap up until that point I was leaving the windows open and the lights on in my bedroom uh, telling my parents I was going to bed early um, and just basically waiting for the moths to come in through the window. And I'd run around with my copy of Skinner and try and identify the few that would come in. And um, and that's how I did it. And occasionally I'd be luxuries of porch lights as well. If I'd persuade my parents to leave the porch light on, they were quite tight. So often they'd turn it off and then I'd have to come down in the middle of the night, sneak down and turn it back on again. Uh, when we we're on holiday, if we stopped at motorway services, uh, a quick whiz round the, uh, that's probably the wrong word to use, but a quick whiz round the gentleman's toilets was always a good place to find moths and still is. Um, although it, as an adult, you get frowned upon a little bit. Um, and, um, you know, for me to see a moth like this, you know, I never got them coming. Uh, the hawk moths very rarely came to my windows. So I remember walking through the woods and actually seeing a pair of these mating. Um, and it was my first hawk moth. So it's a very special moth for me. So I'm so glad I got one of those in the trap. But again, it doesn't matter. I've got a lot of people saying, well, how do we get into mothing? How do we get into uh, um, understanding these insects? And now's a really good time. Um, if you are trying to get into your bird song, for example, um, we tend to recommend people start um, early on in the year, sort of February. Our early species, our early, early territory forming species start singing, which means you can familiarise yourself with those. And then as the season advances and all the exotic uh, warblers and, and the migrants come in and things get kind of confusing, um, then you, you've already filed the, the, the common and the familiar away and then you're ready for the new ones. It's the same with moths. Um, the season's only just started, so it's a good time to start getting to know the few that turn up. Porches, as I said, are brilliant ways of, of any outdoor light. It just might bring in a couple, you know, um, you know, lit windows, anything like that. It might just bring in a few. Get yourself familiar with those, um, and then there's a whole world waiting for you. Not just the uh, the adults either, because let's face it, most moths spend most of their lives as caterpillars. Then you've got the eggs, which are beautiful in form and function. The caterpillars themselves go through several molts, which also are all beautiful in their own ways. Then you've got the, 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 the pupil, the chrysalis, um, and, uh, and the cocoons, and all the ecology and the decisions and the beauty and the survival tactics that go with those. And then the moth is just this kind of frivolous last-minute fling, um, which is the bit you see when they come to your trap. So for me, it's the beginning of, um, I guess it's a portal into killing hours and hours and hours of your life in a useful manner. Um, with so many, uh, look at Lepido Lepidoptera is the group, right? So you've got mo moths and butterflies. Um, and there's uh, 2,600, give or take, if you add them all together. 96% of all the Lepidoptera in the UK are moths. Now, we worry about butterflies. We're always talking about how butterflies are telling us about what's going on in our environment. Just think of the nuances that understanding our moths can add to that particular con um, conversation. But, uh, but anyway, that's my intro to moth. Not very impressive after a frosty night. There's a magic number, by the way. If you want to do moths, <laughs> try and choose a night where it's above 10 degrees. That's the magic number, 10. Nick, those popular hawk moths um, are, are very beautiful, as you say, as adults. Um, that final flurry, as you said, is great. But the caterpillars people frequently find when they're moving from their food plants to hibernate, don't they? They're, yeah. And they're, they're very obvious insects, but they change colour as well. Tell us a bit about that. Well, what they do is, I mean, a lot of the hot, all the hot moths are, they're our biggest moths. So they have basically the biggest caterpillars. So straight away, um, they're not that subtle. And when they leave, in their food plant, when they're in the food plant, popular hot moths, in fact, all the hot moths are um, pretty camouflage that they are they're big juicy protein packet for any bird that wants to that, that, that is looking for them so as a consequence the 
I guess the arms race between predators and prey has meant that, that hawk moths are beautifully coloured. So they are they are counter shaded, which means that uh, when the light falls on them, that they've got a dark top and a light underneath, and they've got these often have these um, uh, diagonal stripes on them to break up the outline. There's got lots of little tricks, but when they're ready to molt, uh, oh sorry, when they're ready to pupate, they go walkies. Um, and so they break cover um, for the first time in their lives. They go for, and, and it's very risky, and that's when we find them. Lime hawk moths are a particular popular um, uh, caterpillar, well, not popular, but they are frequently found caterpillar in our urban centers because a lot of urban tree planting um, um, involves uh, lime trees. And of course, they, they, as their name suggests, they feed as caterpillars on the lime, but then they've got to find some soil. And that means they come down the trees, they change from being beautifully camouflaged with these lovely shades of green, um, and they actually often go a kind of a pink or a yellow, or sometimes look a bit mushy, and then they race as well. They, they're running, they run for their lives, literally, and you often see them trying to find some ground. And the same with the poplar hawk moth. Um, is it's a caterpillar that it doesn't look dissimilar in some ways. It's got a horn on the end of its uh, um, very tip of it, well, above its bum, basically. Um, trying to divide caterpillars up into head, thorax, and abdomen gets confusing. Um, but yeah, it's got it's like a sort of a horn on the end, which makes them very um, identifiable as a group of caterpillars anyway. And they charge around. They, as soon as they come off their food plant, which is either willows or poplars, that sort of thing, um, they'll often be seen, you know, uh, roving around looking for some soft soil, which they then push themselves down into um and find a form of very loose cocoon uh deep underground is also underground and, uh, and under which they're pupates and they'll then emerge this time next year so um yeah it's exciting to so see in the moths means there's just a whole pile of joy yet to come um and if you're very lucky you might get a female in your trap and if you do get a female she might lay some eggs and the chances are they're going to be fertile which means you can rear them yourself and that's you know a beautiful thing to do and uh, it's how how you learn about the subtleties of their life cycle as well. But, uh, but yeah, I love them. Nick, just quickly, um, you, you mentioned <laughs> that the professional moth trap is quite a significant investment. They can be very expensive. But another thing yeah. that people can do is that they could, yeah, there we are. That, <laughs> I know it look, just looks like a plastic bucket. but Well, that's all it is. <laughs> well, yeah. But it, it is a receptacle of great joy when, when you're yeah. with a mercury vapor lamp. But people can also try sugaring. So, I've tried yeah. sugaring, which is when you make this mixture to attract moths. Um, and I've tried it three times, twice, zero moths. And on one occasion, loads of moths. Have, have you got a recipe which people might try at home, which they can Ooh. make up in their kitchen, smear on their, <laughs> on, well, or smear on themselves if they like, or, or, or yeah, yeah. on a tree or something in the garden or a fence <laughs> post to attract moths? Because it can work if you get the recipe right, can't it? It is. It's as much about getting the night right as it is getting the recipe right. You've got to have a mothy night. So um, usually sort of when it gets much warmer, um, you've got to have, um, well, you've got to, I use molasses. So nice, thick, sticky molasses. Sometimes I put some rum in there. Um, uh, what's the stuff that uh, um, uh, it tastes, it's like pear drop. What's it? it smells like pear drops. So I put a bit of that in. Um <laughs> What is it called? It's annoying. Um, uh, various, I, I just make it as stinky and as sticky as possible. It's got to be sickly. And then you heat it all up on the stove. Alcohol is really good. It's good to have sugars and alcohols in there. Anything that, that has a sweet and sticky smell. And you can experiment. You can experiment. Um, put some brown sugar in there as well. Get it fermenting. You know, what, you boil it up on the stove and then put it in a jar and put it somewhere nice and warm. Um, and it will just, I've got, I've got a, a, a jar of it. Um, it's up on the shed at the moment. I'll just bring it down, but um, it just looks like black tar. Um, and then I'll go out with a paintbrush and I'll paint it on posts. Um, and, and it does work, but you've got to have the moths around. I mean, in some ways it's good for species that wouldn't normally be attracted to light. So uh, um, I often get a load of old ladies around mine. So I've heard Nick. So I've heard. <laughs> that, that, those rumours have been going for years. <laughs> we'll move swiftly on to some audience questions. Yeah, there's lots of questions coming in for you, Nick. Um, okay, let's try. So, so, Julie Campbell, how do you know if a caterpillar will be a moth or a butterfly? Oh, that's the hardest. It's one of those questions which it's so obvious when it's sitting there and you've looked at lots of butter, lots of butterfly caterpillars and lots of moth caterpillars. But when you actually have that question, it's very, it's a, what we call, a bird is call it a jizz thing. 
Um, it's about general impression, size and shape. And generally, we sort of know. The rules generally are that if it's got lots of hairs on it, like it's furry, and there's always exceptions to this, it's almost certainly a moth. Um, no, I mean, hot moth, you know, big, big caterpillars, they are going to be moths as well. There's no British butterfly that has a caterpillar any bigger than, than say, that, you know. So um, um, it's a, that's a tricky one. However, there's a brand new book out, which is all about caterpillar ID. And if you want to get to the bottom of that and start working on your caterpillars, I said, that's a suggested um, investment. And it's a cracking book. I don't know if you've seen it, Chris. It's, uh, um, or Megan. it's an absolutely beautiful book. It's, um, it's just come out. I think it's a Bloomsbury one, but it's an absolute stunner. Uh, illustrated by Richard Lewington, who's who's done a lot of their other field guides. All the uh, all the classic guides. I mean, the only one I've got here is my is my my concise moth moth book, but uh, it's in that series and it's a stunner. But um, but yeah, it's a really difficult question to answer that one, Megan. Sorry. That's right. <laughs> Actually, the next question I was going to ask you was which is the best book for moth identification. So, what book have you got there? That one. Um, this is there's actually a newer version of this. Um, there's two versions. There's a big, thick, chunky one, um, which is, is written by Martin in Townsend and illustrated by Richard Lewington. Um, this is the concise one, which is just the pictures, really. Um, beautiful illustrations, really basic information on the opposite page. Um, but it's really good when, you know, when you're there with your moths and you're at the, you know, your coffee in the morning and you can flick through the, the book. Um, it's what I do most summer mornings. My daughter's first word was moth, actually, because she'd come down in the morning and find daddy on the kitchen table surrounded by little tubes with moths in and a book. But that's a good one. There's a bigger, thicker version of this, which is um, has more information about the moths. But then there's uh, there's loads of other books which work together really well. So there's there's um, uh, Manley's photographic guide to moths. Um, there's also Skinner's, which is the book I had as a kid. I still got my original copy that was given to me um on my 16th birthday by my parents all signed you know it's lovely um but um yeah those are the best they're the best books but um, but then there's great resources online now as well and one thing if you're learning moths actually i should mention this butterfly conservation have a fabulous what's flying tonight um it's kind of like an app but it's on the it's on the on the web so it recognizes where you are or you'll put your postcode in and it it then uh, taps into the moth recording scheme and shows you the moths that were recorded last night by by the uh, the aficionados of the moth world and it gives you an idea it helps you whittle down i mean i love these resources would have been a godsend the hours i would have saved in my childhood if that sort of thing existed then it's a really br i mean it's it's a it's a it's a game changer for young um, and uh, um and wannabe mothers so that's a that's a good thing to talk about as well Fantastic. So just one more question, and this is kind of in two parts uh, from two different people, actually, but I'm splicing them together. Jenny F., why don't moths fly off when you pick them up like that? And Robert Hart, do moths sleep in the daytime? OK, well, two, um, my answer is um, they do fly off when you hold them like that because one of them's already gone. So uh, it's about <laughs> it's about... It's about not disturbing them. Some moths, they've all got characters, you see. Some moths are very jumpy and flighty. Some moths, if you poke them, they feign death and they just fall to the floor and they look dead and you can poke them and prod them. Um, and then there's other moths which you just have to look at in the wrong way. You need to look at them with a field guide in your hand and they're, woof, they're gone. And then you've got those which um, rely and trust so much on their crypsis, on their camouflage, like our popular hawk moth, who will just sit there. It, OK, if I if I handle this moth more and more and more, it will start realising the cover is blown and then it will start vibrating its wings, which is how the moths, um, just like bees do this and, and certain beetles, the cockchafers, the maybugs do this as well. They'll almost disconnect their wings and just pump their flight muscles so much they generate uh, metabolic heat which uh, warms their body up to about 37 degrees and then they're off. So um, so they do fly off. It's about being careful. I like to say I'm a, was a moth whisperer, but I just know that this is a good moth. Um, but um, um, and do they sleep in the day? Well, again, some moths um, sleep in is probably a, I'm not sure if sleep is the right word for it. They hide. They rest. They shut down. I guess they're not active. Um, but lots of moths, obviously, are well, they're famous for flying at night. But then we do have day flying moths as well. And, you know, I've got mint moths in the garden, which are these beautiful, tiny little what we call micro moths. They're like little quarks of the moth world. But these things are so beautiful. They're, they're purple and gold and they're day flying moths. A lot of the tiger moths are day flying moths as well. Uh, silver wise, the hummingbird hawk moths um, are, are day flyers. Uh, Emperor moths, which is our only silk moth. 
um, they're day flyers as well. So, so even though it's a, a general thing, um, and there's always exceptions, um, the moths that uh, most of the moths, that, the ones that will come to light at night during the day, will be hiding up somewhere. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that's that, that's sort of the answer. By the way, in France, I, I was doing a study once on burnet moths, which are uh, a day flying moth, and um, my French is terrible. And I noticed, uh, so so is Chris's. Um, I was out and about um, in a meadow catching burnet moths and some curious French tourists were asking, well, not tourists, I was the tourist really, but they came and asked me what I was doing. So I'd already learned that uh, moth, uh, butterflies is, is, is papillon, okay? So that's French for, 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 for butterfly. And moths are beautifully papillon de nuit, butterflies of the night. So what's a day fly moth? So when they asked me what I was doing, I had to try and work it out on the spot. So I said, Papillon de nuit de jour. <laughs> Did that work? <laughs> <laughs> okay. If we have any, got any French viewers or, or any people that have hailed from that country, you apologize. Know anything about moths and the French language, I'm sure they'll <laughs> correct us by the end of the program. Nick, an absolute joy to have you on. As Thanks ever. so much, Chris. Wealth Thanks, Megan. Enthusiasm. Thank you, Nick. Thanks, Nick. A wealth Thanks, of enthusiasm. Eh? And a wealth of knowledge too. Nick is an absolute joy, isn't he? It's That's fantastic. what's so brilliant about naturalists. <laughs> you see, you sit down and you listen to people that have spent their lives with their noses in a moth trap and you learn so much so quickly. It's fantastic. Brilliant. Yeah, it's brilliant. brilliant. Really, really good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Papillon de nuit de jour. Yeah. Okay. Oh, so yesterday we showed you some fantastic photographs from the one and only Paul Goldstein. He showed us some amazing leopard shots, didn't he? That he's been taking. Yeah, they're right. Yeah. They're pretty good. They're pretty <laughs> good. <laughs> and I'm pleased to say that today he's going to be showing us another clip about another one of his obsessions, yeah. who he's been photographing for a really long time. But you can follow him on Instagram at at Paul Goldstein. And his website is paulgoldstein.co.uk. So make sure to go and check out all of his images there because they are absolutely spectacular. Mm. And I mean, this group of photos, which you're about to see, is no exception. So have a look at this. Morning, Chris. Morning, Megan. I'll do that the other way around if we do this again. Um, just had a woodpecker in what would be not a bad place for quarantine or isolation. So this is my daily allowance of Wimbledon Common. Uh, a few more jays this morning, good crows, noisy rooks. Uh, what else have we had? And uh, I thought I saw a couple of chaffinches as well, which is good. My local pond is going well. Kind of funny seeing tiny cygnets with with uh, red buses going past, which which is a thrill. Some more hens scrapping. So again, so yeah, that's good. And um, however, let, let me take you from a depth from a, what is a, a lovely morning and to the icy cold of the Arctic. Polar bears have haunted me since I saw my first one 16 years ago, and I, I've guided a lot of people, I've been lucky and fortunate enough to, to see them, and, and I realized straight away I wanted to see them in their proper environment, and a polar bear's environment is on the ice, on sea ice, and that's what the Arctic has, that's what they need. So to photograph a bear, particularly if it's close weather, swimming through it, but generally just almost perched, on the middle of a huge, what they want is a hunting platform, not just a little island, that's no good to them. Because seals, which is their principal diet, it, it can swim uh, faster than them, so they need to ambush them. Photographing them is a joy. It's often a, a bit of an exposure issue, but if you can use a wide angle, um, it's just joy. So you always want people to indulge themselves with your photos, gorge themselves. They want to look at it and then find something else and think, you know, there's no such thing as a perfect photograph. There never would be. That's why, why would we do it? I've seen Chris beat himself up photographing many, many times because there's nothing, no such thing as getting it absolutely right. But who cares when you've got a subject like a bear in the water, probably 30, 40 nautical miles uh, from land, or even one using a hunting platform uh, of, a, of a piece of ice, of broken glacial ice. That is a thrill. And the more time they spend in the water, the more yellow they become. Sometimes you can be lucky enough to find cubs, particularly if they're cubs of the year, coys we call them. And then it's just a question of keeping that shutter speed over a thousand and seeing what you can do. They can appear cute, please remember they're, they're killers. But of course the advantage you have with bears, the most valuable commodity of any photographing is time. And with 24 hours of daylight, if you don't mind missing your beauty sleep, you can really, really cash in. Close up encounters, obviously dangerous an issue. 
Um, if the sun isn't out, yeah, you overexpose a bit. And just just try and get it sharp. That's that's what matters. Sometimes you know they'd make great jigsaw puzzles when it's just ivory or uh, buttery blob on white. Sometimes you find old icebergs which are blue, so the the contrast is great. Sometimes it's minus 28, minus 30. You've got to be prepared to put in the time. Patience, as I always say, is not a virtue; it's a must. Um, but to find them when you know you're the only people there or the only person there and you've worked for it and even if it's like newborns it it's such a thrill almost a visceral thrill and photography is 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 recording it if you can get something exceptional in perfect light where you get that faunal and meteorological alignment that's what we work for that's why we do the time you've got to be prepared to have a broken shoulder to humping your lenses all around around the world to to find them yeah and remember if you underexpose do it properly you're gonna have a wee, don't lock the door. Polar bears, they haunt me too. Undeniably stunning. Just Undeniably stunning. Exquisite. Yeah. Exquisite animals in yeah. an exquisite environment mm -hmm. and exquisite photos. And of course, as yeah. he says, when you get the faunal and meteorological uh, alignment right, <laughs> <laughs> the faunal and meteorological alignment, right? Um, it, you know, everything comes together. There's some absolutely exquisite images here. We've got one more to show you, which wasn't in that montage. Take a look at this one with these animals perched on top of this ice cliff. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. Now, you may be tempted to think, OK, well, if you go somewhere where there's that spectacular landscape and that spectacular species, all you've got to do is put up your camera and press the shutter. It's not the case. Photography is an art. It requires an enormous amount of intellectual investment, thinking about those photographs and, and then understanding how to make a picture work and how to make that picture communicate to other people and bring them the joy, the awe or the wonder that you might have just experienced looking at Paul's pictures of polar bears. Absolutely stunning, stunning work. And of course, many of the tips that he's offering are not just applicable to polar bears, they're applicable to things that we can be photographing in our back garden too. So thanks, Paul, for all of those pictures. It's really fantastic. Another thing that Paul said there you should take note of is that um, if you're not having a wee, don't close the door. Well, Paul did close the door last night. He closed his bedroom door and his dog, like mine, took a wee on the duvet. And here's a picture of Paul's duvet, <laughs> which has been washed and it's now hanging out in his garden to dry this morning. So, fr frankly, Paul, you know, if your dog's going to maybe have a wee, don't close the door, leave it wide open. And I wish both of us had followed that advice last night and then we wouldn't have to be clearing up after them today. Anyway, we better move on. Let's, <laughs> Let's move on from canine urine. You know, you, you don't get that on, on mainstream media, do you, to be quite honest with you? What a joy that is. Uh, but, but moving on, actually, and changing the tone completely to something more serious. Mm -hmm. Emma Mitchell has been talking about um, mental health and nature's cure and the science behind that. You may have seen that at the beginning of our programme. But now, a very important contribution from Maya Rose Craig, who talks about the impacts of mental health problems on the VMA community, and how, at the moment, one of her primary concerns is that this community isn't able to find those natural cures that so many other people are. Hand over now to Maya Rose Craig. I've been really fortunate growing up, having had the opportunity to go out into nature and develop a love of birds. But I do also have Bangladeshi heritage, and one day I became very aware that there weren't other people like me out enjoying these things. There is significant scientific evidence proving that going out into nature benefits our physical and mental health. There's lots of evidence showing that VME, or visually minority ethnic people, have a much higher incidence of mental illness. For example, although VME people represent roughly 18% of the population, over 60% of those admitted into mental health hospitals are VME, demonstrating this disparity. Black people are also four times more likely to be sectioned under the Mental Health Act, and black men are 17 times more likely than white men to be diagnosed with really serious mental health conditions, such as bipolar disorder. 
Reasons for the high incidence of mental illness in VME people has been put forward as issues such as racism and discrimination, social and economic inequalities, and mental health stigma. However, almost no research has been done into the impact on mental health by lack of access to nature. You can use a map or even Google Earth to work out seven routes from your home that will take about an hour. These should be walking along roads and footpaths that are less busy, where you'll pass grass and trees and don't include going into any heavily used places. On other days, you could try some of these ideas, like just looking up at the sky and watching the clouds and the birds pass over your head, or looking up at night or out of your window to see the night sky because it's so much brighter at the moment with the lack of traffic and light pollution. You could also smell the flowers in your garden or if you don't have one you could try anywhere where there are a few flowers whether wild or not. Take in the smell and really enjoy it and remember how nice it is to be out in nature during these trying times. If you have a garden, a balcony or a window ledge you could do a little bit of gardening by filling up a medium sized old food container with compost or soil and planting seeds or vegetables. And since cooking seems to be a bit of a craze at the moment, you could even do some foraging by collecting nettles to make into nettle soup, which even though I'm a fussy eater, I think is delicious. And there are loads of recipes online. And also if you're fasting for Ramadan at the moment, while you're having sefri and eating breakfast, you could open your window and listen to the birds singing in the dawn chorus. I hope that if you live in an inner city area, you'll be inspired to get connected and get out in nature with your families. Especially during this month of Ramadan, I think it's really important to focus on the positive things for the mind. Staggering statistics there, to be quite honest with you. Thanks, Maya, for revealing those. I think that quite a lot of that data, if you like, that information is not known to the wider public and it should be seriously concerning for us. Uh, Maya is a, a, a remarkable ambassador for the VME community. I think I said VMA on the way and I was confusing my VNA with VME. Um, and, and also a fantastic ornithologist too. She was a, awarded an honorary doctorate mm -hmm. this year, the youngest ever at 18 from Bristol University. Um, and she is as I say, as a great ambassador for this cause and works tremendously hard to find some equality which we desperately need and uh, deserves all of our support. And you can follow her post on Twitter at where she's bird girl at bird girl on twitter so follow Maya there thank you Maya for that mm. contribution as i say really shocking shocking statistics mm. okay so there's been lots of talk about dogs peeing on beds but we had a lovely message from um jackie o'brien who said that her dog actually gave birth to three puppies last night on the bed on the bed wow so that's lovely well, that's a, a sleepless bit... night because of that so that's a nice one yeah jackie what a what a treat that would be that's never happened to me and i wouldn't complain about any mess at all if that happened <laughs> no not in the slightest so today we only have one birthday actually um, so this is Spencer. You are 14 today. So oh. a very happy birthday to you, Spencer. Um, you watch the show every morning. Um, so thank you so much for tuning in to us. And we really wish you the very best today. Happy birthday, Spencer. Um, we were sent in another photograph, actually. And, and this one, Chris, I think you're going to like specifically. Um, because it's actually a photo of you and Nick Baker sent in by Richard Hughes. Have a look at this. Now, it right. might not be, mm. you know, all of you, but it really represents, you know, maybe yeah. your younger years, yeah. symbolises, you, know, you have everything going on there, don't yeah, you? Yeah, Nick got, and I both, both sort of had a little bit of a... both got the quiffs. Quiffs going on for a little while. <laughs> Mine was blonde, it would need to be an albino, uh, albino heron for me, but yeah, I get the point. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. there we are. <laughs> Blast from the past. Past from um, that past. Okay, what else have we got coming Well, up? we have to reveal the quiz. Okay, the quiz, of course. The quiz, right, go on then, go on. Let me have a little look. You get it out for me. So people have got this one right. Well done. Facebook, we've got Carrie, we've got Gary, uh, Gary, Francis, Rachel, Sue, Fiona, Mary. YouTube, we've got Oliver and Tanya too. So well done to everyone who got that right. Do you want right. the pleasure? I love this one so much. Right, go on. You went to twist it like this, apparently. Really? I was re oh yeah, I was reading in the box. You meant to twist it like you're twisting a radiator. 
You know, I've been reading in the book. Yeah, there's a there's a information on how best to do it. Okay. So I think you should be the answer. Okay, the answer is Ooh. common starling. We have the starling. Common starling. Yeah. Yeah, okay, what it says in the box here. Um, <laughs> starlings like imitating other birds' voices. This whistle can imitate starlings, whether you find them in groups flying on the ground. Grip it in the middle and let the tubes between your thumb and forefinger. Then move your hand as if you were playing table football ah. with half regular movement. Listen to the warbling as if it were a cradle. I think maybe <laughs> some of that has been lost in translation. <laughs> Oh, hold on, hold on. Put that down. Sorry, I'm getting a bit excited. It says, no use by children before seven years. Exclamation mark. Exclamation mark. Excellent stuff. Excellent stuff. And I can only guarantee that throughout the course of the week, (laughs) our little French devices are going to get weirder and weirder. (laughs) So there we are. (laughs) Okay, let's wrap it up. Unlikely nature beast. Hashtag unlikely unlikely nature. nature. So a focus for nature is a fantastic group of people who are youth inspired, connecting people from all around the UK and of course further afield in different stories um, to engage with nature and wildlife. And they have <laughs> they have a new campaign which has just launched. So we're asking everybody um, to get out into your maybe you're on your daily walk, maybe you're in your garden, maybe you're even in your house. And you find something which is a bit of unlikely nature. So we're asking you to take a photograph of it, post it on social media using the hashtag unlikely nature. Um, so we're trying to spread a bit of positivity, a bit of hope throughout social media. So perhaps there's a flower that's emerged through a concrete crack or perhaps there's just, you know, a piece of light that's hit a leaf in a really beautiful way. An unlikely bit of nature and we want to brighten up everybody's social media feed. So make sure you put those photos in and use the hashtag unlikely nature. Unlike your nature, try and get involved. Uh, okay, coming up tomorrow, we've got sharks. Yes, we do. We've got Paul Goldstein doing tigers. Some remarkable tiger pictures he's got there. Mm-hmm. Very pleased that Emma Mitchell will be back with more scientific information about how nature can offer a secure. I'm loving mm-hmm. Emma's stuff. It's, it's really, really brilliant. Lindsay will be with us, of course, and we have a message from the Wildlife Trust. Yeah. So we'll see you tomorrow at mm-hmm. nine o'clock. We will, but make sure to send your questions and queries in to Lindsay Chapman, uh, who you can find on social media and on our SI. BC feeds as well, and we'll answer them then. And the lesson of the day? A spoonful of soil. A spoonful of soil. Okay, you beat me. You <laughs> beat me to the fact that if your dog might have a wee, open the door. See you tomorrow. Bye, everyone. Have a great day. Bye.